Well, look, the question that we'll think about is, is there meaning in the confusion? And that's, um, that question title is deliberately intended to engage with the last 18 months that we've been through. I wonder if you can cast your mind back to March back in 2019 when COVID hit and when we went down into lockdown. And can you remember what those early few days were like as chaos and confusion hit? So this is a little bit of what it was like for, for me. I'm married to Rebecca. She's a surgeon. We've got two kids, five-year-old and a three-year-old. And so Rebecca at that time was a surgeon in St. Thomas's Hospital, London. The COVID ward of St. Thomas's Hospital um, became the busiest and most COVID infectious place in the whole of the UK. All of the doctors, given the influx of patients, were repurposed, whatever your specialty, to helping out on the COVID ward. And strangely, if you can think back to it, for the first three weeks of the pandemic, all doctors in St. Thomas's Hospital, at least, were told not to wear personal protective equipment, PPE, because it would scare patients and they weren't yet sure exactly what the science was on it. That sounds crazy, right, as I said out loud. But anyway, what that meant was that Rebecca quickly got COVID, and then she brought it back home, and we as a whole family went down with it. So then the church building was shut. Church of England buildings were shut for the first time in 800 years. Church buildings had stayed open through plagues, through the Great Fire of London, through two world wars, but it became shut because of COVID. And so chaos was going on in the church. I was laid up in bed with COVID. My wife was ill with COVID. And then, of course, given our son Oliver was at school, we suddenly had you know, to become part-time or full-time, depending on your view of life, educators as well. And my view of teachers was already pretty high, but having tried to get my son at home to engage and to learn things, then it is even higher still. I mean, so just, that's just a little glimpse, and you'll have your own stories, right? So we had chaos, confusion, COVID and hospitals, churches shut, governments on their knees, communities in crisis, and in the midst of all of that chaos and confusion, as a pastor, when we started talking to the church family and started talking and picking up the phone um, to members of the community, one question came up time and time and time again. Why? What's going on? Why is God doing this? Why is he allowing this? The why question came up. In other words, isn't it interesting, or not interesting, but rather isn't it notable that in the midst of chaos and confusion, we want to find out why. In other words, we need to know meaning to make some sense of this chaos that is going on. The singer-songwriter Ed Ames, who um, composed a song in 1967 in the midst of the kind of confusion around the Vietnam War and America trying to work out its place in the world, composed a, a song which echoed that kind of search for meaning in the midst of chaos and confusion. The first verse goes a little bit like this, and I won't sing it, I'll just say the words to you. Through the canyons of the mind, we wander on and stumble blind, searching through, the st sorry, through starless nights and sunless days. Um, we wander on as if in a daze, hoping for some kind of clue, a road to lead us to the truth, but who will answer? When the soul is darkened by a fear it cannot name, when the mind is baffled and the rules don't fit the game, who will answer? Who will answer? Who will answer? And that haunting kind of refrain, who will answer, comes up time and time again because he's framing it as this, in the midst of chaos and confusion, why? What's going on? Someone's got to answer. There's got to be meaning, right? And that's really what this talk is about. Is there meaning in the confusion? Or do we just live in a world where you have to shrug your shoulders and say, hey, look, that's just what happens. Life is chaotic. Any search for meaning is, ten day, um, you know, is just not really something you can grasp hold of. It's you constructing it. Or is there a real meaning behind things? And what I want to do as we look at this passage that Ashley read for us is notice from it how Jesus draws our attention to three things in our search for meaning. First of all, he draws our attention to our distraction from meaning. Secondly, he draws our attention to the ways that we try to construct meaning and the flawed attempts to construct meaning. And then thirdly, he draws our attention to the loving offer of meaning that he is making um, for in a relationship with his Father in heaven. So let's think, first of all, about our distraction from meaning. Because one of the things we need to grasp is that most of the time, in most situations, as human beings, we don't think about this. And actually, one of our big problems is we don't think about this question nearly enough. Socrates, um, at the trial for his life, was supposed to have said, 
that the unexamined life is not worth living. But the reality is that often we just get caught up in the busyness and the humdrum and the rat race of life, and so we don't pause and reflect on some of the things that really matter. I don't have time, we think. Or maybe we just get distracted. And one of the great problems with that is that when life gets shaken a little bit, we suddenly realize we haven't got the foundations that we really need to feel stable in the midst of chaos and confusion. I wonder if you noticed in the passage what Jesus says. He asks a really important question, but it's in the context of anxiety. And anxiety is just every day. We all feel anxious at different times for different things. But what he doesn't say when someone comes to him with anxiety is, he doesn't say, hey, look, you're just feeling anxious. It'll soon pass. It'll be fine. No, he uses it as an opportunity to probe at the deeper issues it is exposing. And he asks this, why do you worry about clothes? See, or the word literally is consider. That means slow down, stop being distracted. Think for a moment how the flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin by implication like you're doing. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Notice that call to consider. In the, the Greek, the word is literally to become wise by reflecting. In other words, he's saying, just slow down for a moment. Become attentive. Become thoughtful. Reflect. Stop running around just doing life and think for a moment about what it's all about. There is a time for that, isn't there? Of course, you can't do it all the time, but I wonder if that's really our problem. Isn't our problem that we don't do it at all? Particularly in our age, I wonder if one of the great problems is distraction. Uh, these lovely and hateful devices. They're lovely, aren't they? They give so many opportunities. Connection, efficiency, entertainment. They're also really annoying as well. You're trying desperately to concentrate on a really important conversation with someone, and something buzzes. And suddenly, before you've even noticed it, your mind is elsewhere. You, you see this person talking to you, you're wondering what that buzz, and how can you try and suss out what that buzz was about without making them feel awkward? And then you've lost complete track, and you try and zone back in the conversation, and you realize you missed something really important that they've said, and they've noticed your eyes have gone, and now you're distracted, and they're distracted. Ah! It's not just me. Interesting. Um, in a Pew Research uh, center um, finding a few years back, nearly 90% of teachers said that digital technologies were creating an easily distracted generation with short attention spans. There was a common sense study of the same year. 71% of teachers said they thought technology was hurting attention spans somewhat or a lot. And almost half of all teachers said it hurt critical thinking and homework skills. And let's be honest now, it's not just for the children, right? It hurts our attention spans too. Our ability to slow down, to unplug, to consider or reflect. I often quote the writer Dostoevsky who wrote, the secret of a person's existence is not only to live, but to have something to live for. He wrote that in the Brothers Karamazov in the Grand Inquisitor poem section. It's a really important point. And Jesus is making that point. He's saying, Stop running around and just doing life, laboring and spinning, slow down, consider, reflect, as so you ask questions to provoke us. But to work that out, we've got to give ourselves the space. So thanks for coming along today, and I, I hope in this space that we just get a moment to pause and to reflect and ask that question that may or may not have been nagging away you for 18 months. But here's one of the things. Often when a crisis comes, it pauses us. It slows us down, it stops us in our tracks, and it causes us to pause and reflect and to ask the big questions. But you and I both know, six, 12 months' time, be like a bungee cord, won't it? We'll be back to normal. The new normal won't be quite the old normal, but it'll feel very normal. And that question, the nagged away at you under lockdown, it'll be gone. You'll be too busy now to think about it. So take the opportunity now. Let's pause. Let's do what Jesus asked. Let's consider. And as we do, I want us to know, because our flawed attempts to construct meaning, our flawed attempts to construct meaning, Jesus says in verse 28, see how the flowers of the field grow, they do not labor or spin. Now, that, on one level, that's an interesting reflection, but isn't that a little bit unfair? 
I mean, flowers don't labor or spin. Well, there's a good biological reason for that, right? They draw their nutrients from the ground and they get their energy from the sun. That's about the limit of my biology right there. Okay, they don't need to labor or spin. And I bet you, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that'd be nice for a bit. Maybe just to be a flower swaying in the breeze with the sun and getting the energy up from the ground and the nutrients from the ground just by being there. So isn't that a little bit unfair of Jesus to say the flowers don't need to labor or spin, so why do you labor or spin? Biology, Jesus. No, he's making a point. The labor or the spinning, it, it's more than just activity to maintain life. Rather, it's the drivenness he's noticing. It's that sense of, I've got to do more to kind of feel like I am more. It's the attempt to find meaning in what we do or what we have. That's what he's pointing at. That's the laboring and the, the spinning. You know, it's all of our attempts to feel like if I just had enough stuff, then I feel like having enough would make me enough. That's acquisition. Or it's achievements. If I just could do enough and get enough things on my CV or things that I can drop into conversation or make enough of a mark on this world, then I would feel I was enough. And acquisition and achievements are two of the big ways in Western society we try to construct meaning and make ourselves feel like we've done enough and we are enough. Susan Orlean is a journalist writing for The New Yorker and an author of a number of books, particularly spending time with high-profile people. And she has spent years observing people in the Big Apple, and she wrote this. Like everyone else, I, too, had set out to be remembered. I'd wanted to create something permanent in my life, some proof that everything in its way mattered, that working hard mattered, that feeling things mattered, that even sadness and loss mattered because it was all part of something that would live on. That's the search for meaning. If I can just do enough or, or get enough or, or be enough, then I'll find meaning. What well, does it work? Let's think first of all about achievements. Achievements, sorry. No, let's think instead about acquisition. We'll come to achievements in a moment. Acquisition. Jesus says in the passage, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? And notice he's not saying, no, are you not sustained in life by food? Because, of course, the answer is yes. He's saying, look, life is more than just food. It's more than just getting stuff. It's more than just clothes. It's more than just acquisitions. And we know this, right? He doesn't even need to really argue. He just asks the question because intuitively we say, yeah, life is more than just stuff. You know, we have that silly phrase, he or she who dies with the most toys wins, and actually the bottom line is, no, they just die like everybody else. They don't win. What do they win? You can't take it with you. It's just stuff. J.D. Rockefeller, the multi-millionaire, was asked at the height of his riches, how much is enough? And he famously answered, just a little bit more. In other words, it's never enough. It never makes you feel like you have enough, and it never makes you feel like you are enough. Because life, Jesus says, and we nod along with this, is more than what you get. It's more than stuff. You matter because you're more than matter. But is it achievements? What about doing things and achieving things? I don't know if you've um, read Andre Agassi's brilliant autobiography that came out a few years ago called Open. And he is wonderfully open in the autobiography about what it looks like and feels like to be someone who really achieves. Famously, his whole career was focused on knocking Pete Sampras off as the world number one. And then one day he achieved it. He was in the French Open, he just made the semi-finals, and he'd finally knocked Pete Sampras off from number one. This you know, drivenness that he had through all his childhood, all of his young adult years, finally he's done it. So he's achieved his great goal that he's been laboring at for so long. He's top of the world, literally, in the world of tennis. And he goes back to his hotel room and he gets a journalist who phones and gets put through to his hotel room. He picks up the phone call and the journalist says to him, Andre, how does it feel? And he tells the journalist what they want to hear. He tells the journalist what he wants to believe. It feels great, top of the world, everything I dreamed of. He puts down the phone and in the autobiography he says, the truth is, it's all lies. I feel nothing. And he goes out and walks the streets of Paris that night, 
suddenly dealing with this great question, what's it all about? Why? If I've achieved everything and I feel nothing, it can't be about achievements, right? Life is more than stuff, but also life is more than your CV. You are more than your CV. Meaning isn't found there. And look, we, we know this because <laughs> our great myths and the parables and the great stories that we've heard down the ages all warn us of these things. The tough thing is to be attentive to it. King Midas. You know, he just wanted Midas' touch to be able to touch something and it turned to gold. And the gods gave him what he wanted. But of course, the sad truth was that with everything being able to turn to gold, every time he tried to eat, he turned his food to gold, and so he nearly starved to death. It's a parable to teach us that trying to get everything, you can actually lose the most important things to you. Or think of Odysseus and the sirens on the rocks trying to beckon the sailors to them, but the sailors have to plug their ears, otherwise they're going to end up shipwrecking their lives in the pursuit of their dreams. It's a parable. We, we, we know this stuff, but we struggle to be attentive to it and to reflect on it. And so most of us are doing what Jesus calls here, laboring and spinning. And Jesus wants to say to you, if you labor and you spin and you hustle and you have a side hustle and you, know, you have all of the things and you finally even get it, have you thought, is it going to be enough? Ultimately, it won't be enough because you're made for so much more. Which brings us to the third and final point, the loving offer of meaning. Instead of all the laboring and spinning, the vain attempt to construct meaning for ourselves outside of relationship with God, Jesus offers us something far better. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. In other words, learn the lesson from nature. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Verse 28, see how the flowers of the fields grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes them, the grass of the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? There's an invitation here for two things. First of all, a realization of a relationship. Secondly, a grasping of your value. A realization of relationship and a grasping of your value. Let's talk about the first one, a realization of relationship. Your heavenly Father is the phrase he uses. Your heavenly Father feeds the birds of the air. He will feed you. But implicit, there's a question in there, which is, do you know you have a Father in heaven? Is that a relationship you're in? Or is it just, you're so busy laboring and spinning, God, I don't have plenty of time to think about that. I'm just going to do my thing, do my hustle and my side hustle. Look, intuitively, I think if I talked to most of you and asked you where is meaning to be found, you'd probably get close to relationships. You'd probably say, I know it's not an acquisition, Pete. I know it's not in achievements. That's just a bit too hollow. But you might say relationships, loving family, loving friends. You're on the right path, Jesus would say. But if it's just human relationships, as important as those are, you're neglecting the one great relationship above all relationships that you're made for, to know God. And not just to know him as some kind of distant, inferior, disconnected, remote individual, him as God up in cloud nine and you down here. No, 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 to know him as your father in heaven. Now look, in a room like this, there'll be different experiences of fathers. Some will be great, some will be terrible, and everything in between. But even for those of you who've not had the experience of a father that you'd long for, that just serves to highlight you know what a father should be. Loving, caring, attentive, wise, knowledgeable, putting your good first. And that is the picture of what it means to know God as your father in heaven. He loves you. Oh, how he loves you. He knows you. He cares about you. And he's infinitely wise and infinitely good. And there's nothing he won't do for you. He'll give you every good thing, which doesn't often mean giving you your dreams because our dreams are so flawed, but it means giving you what is wise to give you. So to know God in heaven and in some sense to walk through life with God having made everything and having given you gifts and having given you all of the joys of the things to engage with in life and yet not to relate to God is the biggest mistake that any human being can make, which is ultimately why acquisitions and achievements and stuff never fills the gap 
because it's a God-shaped gap. It's too big. And you can stuff things into it all you like, but you'll never feel satisfied because you're made for more. You're made for relationship. You're made for that relationship. But not just that. He also wants you to grasp your value. He says, look at the birds of the air. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Again, notice the question. He wants you to ask the question, are you more valuable than the birds of the air? Well, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, intuitively, if you look at birds and look at human beings, why are we more valuable than them? Difficult to tell. But an understanding of your relationship to God will tell you how valuable you are, because first of all, he made you in his image, and he hasn't made birds in his image, as wonderful as they are. And not only has he made you in his image, but he's also paid a very precious price for you. The story is told of a master model maker who was brilliant at making um, ships, models of ships. And one day he worked on his masterpiece, um, a beautiful galleon with incredible intricacy. He worked on it for years. And finally, one day, he finished it, and he put it on his mantelpiece, and there it was, just in splendor and glory, an absolute masterpiece. But sadly, later that night, he was burgled, and the masterpiece was stolen, taken away from him. And he mourned it greatly, mourned its loss. A number of years later, he was notified that the masterpiece that he had made had turned up in an auction house. And so he journeyed a long, long way to the auction house. And there he used all of his life savings and he bought back his masterpiece, his model. And as he received it back from the auction house, he was overheard to be saying this, you are twice mine, and therefore more precious to me now than you ever were, for I made you, and I've brought you back to myself. Friends, that is a picture of what God says when someone comes to know him through Jesus Christ. He has made you, oh, he loves you. He's made you in his image, but he's also bought you back. How did he do that? How do you know you're valuable? Because of the price he was willing to pay for you. The Bible says that God was pleased to pay for you the price of his own precious son. Now pause for a moment. How precious is the son of God? I mean, if he is God himself in human form, then is he not infinitely precious, of infinite worth? And yet God the Father was pleased for your sake so you could be brought back to himself to give him up. Jesus was pleased to offer himself as a sacrifice so that you could be brought back. And so, you know, when you question, when the world says you're not valuable because you haven't achieved enough or you haven't got enough, you're not of much worth, you can say, no, I know I'm valuable because God made me and he paid the most precious price for me. And therefore, my value is infinite because the price of the Son of God is infinite. And that buoys you up and it sustains you and you suddenly find meaning in that, in a relationship with God and in the value he imputes and gifts to you. You are twice loved, more precious now than you were at first, for he has made you and he's brought you back to himself. In some senses, there could be no greater tragedy than going through life and just laboring and spinning and surviving, but never really living because you don't know what life's about. That's what I've been trying to get at. Well, I wonder if you realize as we pause and slow down for a moment that acquisitions and achievements are never going to do it for you. I'd love to save you the journey of trying. But instead, there's a free offer here from God to you to find relationship with him, to find meaning in that relationship with him as your father in heaven, and to find your value located in what he's done for you, giving his son to die for you. And therefore, you know you are of infinite worth and if there's nothing else to take away from this talk, I want to offer that to you and say that is the meaning of life. The question is what you're going to make of that.